Blow it up. I look like slightly tighter thumbnail. Just make sure I have like proportions right, perspective, and everything like that. And then on top of that, I'll go in and do go like basically directly into inks because I'm working digitally. I don't have to do the pencil and everything like that. And then I do colors over that. You do your own colors too. Yeah. Yeah, watch out for this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about you, Mirka? What do you do when you get a script? How do you draw it's it? Not, it's not so different. I also do uh, the thumbnails. And uh, I think it's the most important part. And um, also the fun is too. Because uh, you, you are very free to do the doodles, you know, to find the, the solution. And I think it's fun. I also draw, I, I must, uh, most of my draws are digital. Also, but, but also sometimes when I do a work in traditional, I starting, uh, in any case, studying the layouts on digital. So, uh, because I'm used to that. And so I, I can see in a better way on digital. And I, bas and, uh, I wor when I work in traditional, I uh, watch the, what I did uh, as layouts in digital. So uh, sometimes I print that and uh, use the table, uh, the like table. And uh, I, I do the pencils on the layout, so digital layout. You ready to sub in, Jamal? Sure. All right. <laughs> because like, get me out of here. <laughs> Eventually, we're just gonna get out what a new panel this is, and it's yeah. gonna be like stacked like the sketch tools are. All right, you had a question, sir. Oh, uh, actually, hold it for one second, and we'll let him talk about the drawing and how he started it, so we can kind of catch up with you guys, okay? Okay, so I started pretty much the same way as America. I used a blue pencil crayon to sort of rough out like where the head goes, the general proportions, and then came in with pencil to do my line work. Because I work digitally, whenever I do traditional sketches, I actually don't ink my stuff. I will do blue pencils, then pencils, then go into it uh, with my markers doing shading and everything. So that's what I'll be doing now. And then I'll do my finishing touches, like if I need to go in with a pen or anything after that. So yeah. Can From I ask here. you a stupid question? Hmm? Why blue? Why are the pencils blue? <laughs> <laughs> I've always wondered and I've, I've never asked. Yeah, it doesn't reproduce. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? There are specific oh, yeah, like yeah. blue pencil crayons where if you scan it, it won't reproduce in the, in your file. So yeah. you can go in with your blue pencils, go in with your inks over that, and then if you like didn't ink over everything, it won't show the blue pencil. My mind is blown. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you had a question, sir. Yeah, uh, how long did, did it take you to, from sending portfolios to actually getting a job? So how long from when you started peddling your wares until you made it? David? Uh, two years. Yeah, two years. Well, a little less because I drew for a couple of months uh, and then tried to get work and I got shot down by I mean, a couple of months. I didn't know what I was doing at all. But I uh, ran into, uh, Kyle Hotz is probably the most helpful artist that I ran into. He spent so much time with me and, and really gave me a blueprint for how to proceed and, and learn on my own. And uh, I broke in earlier than I really should have because I was working in a studio where I had an internship and I wasn't expected to really know what I was doing. They were teaching me on the job. So I just needed to show enough that I could potentially work out. A lot of people didn't. So, yeah, I got very lucky. How about you, Mirka? How long to break in? Um, a lot because uh, I started to work in comic, uh, in the comics, uh, not as artist, but I started to work as colorist for a very long time. I started at uh, 19, and uh, I wanted to make also comic a as artist. At that time, I was very uh, manga style very manga style and was not so good for American market. After a while uh, I started to uh, be interested in American comics uh, and I tried to make my uh, style more realistic. Also to be honest my style is still manga. 
but a little bit. But uh, um, so I I I I took a lot of practice years years, and I started to work uh, seven years ago. Ten, I have to say thanks to internet, because I remember. Um, there was an editor by uh, Dynamite that see my work, and uh, before that, that I never worked on comics in my life, and uh, not as artist. And I started like that. It was really not uh, uh, lucky. I was very lucky. Jamal's story is my favorite. How long did it take you? <laughs> <laughs> he, told, he said this on a panel the other day and I almost fell over. What, what happened? How did you wind up breaking into DC? Uh, I ended up breaking in, very luckily, kind of on accident. Um, I did a lot of fan art. I did a lot of redesigns and stuff like that and just posted them online like at DeviantArt or Tumblr and stuff like that. And one of the editors at DC happened upon it, just I guess on his own time, and saved it. He wasn't working at DC at the time, but he, I guess he really liked the work and saved it. And when he did become an editor at DC, found me and gave me a Twitter DM about if I wanted to work on a book. Yeah. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I just want to say, because asking how to break in, um, it's not luck really at all. If you put your stuff out there and it's good enough, they will find you because they're always looking for somebody that has something special always so I would definitely recommend just working on the work and letting it it'll fall into place I uh, think luck is a funny word to use here because <laughs> yeah. a lot of people put redesigns and stuff online sure. and don't get DMs from DC editors so you know um, it's uh, if it's out there it has a better chance of being seen what was somebody saying that every for every piece of your art that you hand to somebody or for every ash can that you produce there's a 10% chance that it'll get in front of the right person or so, I can't remember who said it on the panel but it was something like that it's it's volume put yeah. as much out into the world as you can um, but yeah that's my favorite breaking in story yeah. it's officially my favorite yeah not even trying it right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, fan art. <laughs> can you talk a little, well, I'll get to some more questions, but can you talk a little bit about how you, how you do that shading? How you've decided uh, what to? Yeah, um, when I am penciling, I sort of, I'm thinking about where my lighting is going. So I know this side of the figure is the most complicated one, so I tend to put my rim light uh, here. So here I'm going to leave this part and these parts completely white. And then to, give contrast, I'm going to come in with black right next to it and come and sort of like gradiate here so my actual like highlight, specular highlights will be here and here where I left it white here as well. So I just block that in in a very light gray and then I'm going to come in with black again and sort of like that is not black. I'm going to come in with black here and just gradiate it this way. And uh, gradient lighter, 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 so I can get that contrast that like you really need when you're drawing a Batman piece. How important is reference to you to learn how to draw light like that? Like extremely. I am constantly looking at uh, pictures just on the internet of figures. Uh, I go to life drawing a lot. That helped me immensely with both my anatomy and both how lighting works. Because generally, when you go to light drawing, life drawing, they will have different lighting setups. Or you could just uh, move around the model and because lighting is stationary when you're going session to session, you will get, okay, the light is here, so when I'm here, this is how it falls across the face and the body and like that. So going to light drawing and paying attention to details like that will definitely help you to understand how to draw it when you're drawing superhero comics. How about you guys? Do you guys use reference? Uh, sometimes, for sure. Um, I, I've got a huge folder full of uh, like anatomical reference, um, like photographs, that kind of thing. I don't use it a lot, but when I need it, it really, you know, I, I find there are areas, there are areas that I didn't learn when I was first learning that are just a struggle for me to retain now. Uh, no matter how much I do it, it just seems like it doesn't, the stuff that I learned early on stayed for, you know, I think it's harder when you're older. So uh, like backs, for instance, I use reference as much as I possibly can. Um, 
Yeah, and then uh, I'll, I'll, uh, to be totally honest with you, I, uh, most of my style, pretty much my whole style, is is from other comic books. You know, Kevin Nolan is a huge one for me. Mike Fignola, uh the Kuberts, um, uh, Frank Frazetta. I look at their stuff all the time and you know take things a lot. I really didn't do leg drawing at all, but you know I'm I'm not. I didn't do schooling for it, so I think I kind of missed out on that. How about you, America? Reference. Yes, I use it uh, also uh, because it, I think it's important. If, if you think about a th something, uh, if you don't see a real reference, if it's difficult. But uh, also, sometimes when I also if I draw a character a lot of times, I always put an image in front of me because for sure I'll forget uh, a detail. Always is is the character I draw it, it a lot of time. I remember uh, when I draw some character, if I don't have the reference uh, in front of me, I forgot something of the costume for sure. Question. Yes, ma'am. Do you ever find, like, because you're working in comics, that you're drawing the same character over and over again, do you ever have trouble, like, sectioning out your time? Like, do you find that you worry away on one panel and then... Yeah, absolutely. And um, then there's a deadline, and I found there's a stick figure. <laughs> I found uh, you, Tom King, it in. I have this very, I have this tick that I need to draw everything. So if I'm drawing a environment, I need to draw like every building, every window. I need to draw people in the background, and you can't do that when you're drawing comics because you have a deadline. And suddenly there's no Batman. Exactly. It's just a really good building. <laughs> so. Fans love that. <laughs> <laughs> so I definitely have to train myself to strip back what I don't need for the storytelling. If this panel just works with Batman in an action pose or Batman talking to this one person and the people in the background don't matter, the actual background doesn't matter, then don't draw that because it might, it's probably going to get covered up by word, word balloons anyway. So focus on what's happening, what's going to like really sorry, what's going to really pertain to the storytelling and get that across, and then everything else comes after that. It's a secondary. How about you, America? How do you pace yourself? Yeah, uh, <laughs> when I have to rush, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, as he said, more or less, uh, I try to be more concentrated on the, the storytelling, and I try to do... Uh, it's hard because... If you have to do fast, uh, sometimes you fear that, uh, I fear that uh, it would be not good to see. But sometimes I have to, so I try to be concentrated on the, imp on the important things of the, tab of the page. For my part, I tend to assembly line everything. I found a long time ago I work most efficiently if I... Um, sketching the whole page really quickly and then I do like a tight cartoon so it's just there's no line weights there's no shadow <coughs> and just drawings of the figure is just like outlines basically and with all the detail I do the whole page that way and then I throw in all the shadows and then I put in the rendering uh, and you know that way um, if I really if there's you know a major deadline push or something it just ends up a little less rendered and you know I can but at least the actual page is solid and everything's there it's crazy. It happened to all three of them right before the panel. <laughs> <laughs> you ever have days when you just don't want to draw? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> like, drawing comics is a lot of work. It's very time consuming. You don't want there will be days where you don't want to do it, and if you're lucky, your deadline works out where you can take a day off. You can take a time to just refresh, don't think about anything, do something else you like, and then come back the next day and refresh and like attack it there. And then sometimes you have a tight deadline and you just have to do it. And it's a job, so you just have to do it and push through. How about you, America? Any days when you're just like, I just want to go read a book? Totally. Sometimes uh, it happens, it's normal because it's a work, uh, as every work. Obvi but uh, uh, also if I'm very lucky because 
I draw for work and this is the dream of my life. Sometimes I feel like, um, yeah, I, I'm not in the mood. And I remember when I was younger, I thought it was, uh, this work was uh, all fun. Because when you don't know about uh, it for real, you think, oh, okay, you wake up in the morning, draw what you want, and that's it. Well, that's not like that. So the first time was a little uh, traumatic. Traumatic. How about you, David? Any oh. days when you just want to... Yes, and I get beat by that a lot, actually. Like, I, I wish I could... Because it is true, it's a job, and you have to do it. And, you, you know, if you start falling behind and blowing deadlines, you will not work long, really. And you, they need to be able to rely on books coming out. It's, it's incredibly important. So, yeah. But what ends up happening to me is I won't work for two days and I'll play my video game downstairs. I've got the thing downstairs where my wife is. She's okay. so, and uh, then I just end up having to burn through as much as I possibly can toward the end of the week and I don't sleep and, you know, it's torture. And the other thing, it's a big responsibility is you have a colorist and an inker, um, depending on how you work, that are waiting for the pages from you. And if you turn in 20 pages at the end of the month, they are screwed, you know? And, and having uh, the rest of your team not be able to sleep and everything, I, I have done that so many times. I really try not to do that, you know? Especially as I've gotten older, I try to be a little bit more, think about you know, more than just me. Yes, ma'am. So um, when you do comics and stuff, so what would you compare it to Like, do you think it's a lot like storyboarding? Or? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, where it would differ from storyboarding is in storyboarding you'll have a lot of pan shots and you can't do that in comics. You really have to just have moments. Uh, so there, that's a difference, but otherwise it's very similar. Um, you want to hit that key moment in, in uh, a scene where it, it gets across you know, the concept of, of what's happening in that panel is, is, is dramatically and, you know, as effectively as possible, good composition of it. And that's, you know, the best story borders do that amazingly well. And uh, you also, you want to have an establishing shot so you see where everything is. It's, it's very, very important. When you have a scene, you have a good shot, you see, you know, the environment, so you know where everything takes place. And then you go and you move into, you know, like maybe a mid shot, so you, you see where the characters are in that environment, and then you go into faces. And once you're you're drawing, you know, people talking back and forth. It, even if you don't draw that environment in every panel, it's easy to remember where. Like it, a reader fills in that gap very easily, and so I try to bear that in mind. And I, I've gotten some really great. Like Quentin Tarantino does some of the most incredible establishing shots, and so I, I watch that stuff, and I don't know how much I really. Retain, but you know I love watching it. Would you oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. You can do a follow. Up. So, would you recommend like studying like certain films or um, set, like for <coughs> shots? And stuff? There is actually a website. I can't remember the name of it, but it's um, it's like a cinematography website, and they have all kinds of stills from different movies um, that are you know just really really well shot, and they just show you know some of the 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 more innovative um, shots. I wish I could tell you, but I've, I've got so many of them saved on my computer and, you know, um, I think I almost do that more, you know. When I'm watching movies, a lot of times I just, I end up just getting lost in the movie. So, you know, I, I forget to do that, but yeah, movies I would recommend. All the old um, uh, film noir stuff, like I wish I could say like one specific, but I, I really like framing with black, that kind of, you know, that kind of way of working, so that stuff is very influential. Uh, honestly, I just want to say Frank Miller. I mean, really, you know, he's the best. And he's distilled that stuff so perfectly, I would highly recommend. You know, movies are great, Frank Miller is the best. Okay. We're going to swap out Jamal for David here. Do you want to make any more comments on how you did your shade? Because you, you gave them a really nice look at mm. some shading and some lighting. Uh, it's pretty much what I said before. It's a lot. I do a lot of blending, so uh, for blending with markers, I will go into it with the base lighter shade, then go into it with the darker shade, and then come back into it with the lighter shade. 
And when you have a darker marker and you use a lighter marker on top of it, it will sort of blend automatically onto it. So like that's what I did here and in here and in here, which is like a really nice trick to get if you don't want like a super solid graphic line and you just want blending. I'm sorry, okay. Sorry, yeah. So you have a dark and then a light. Yes, here, I'll do it. Yeah, okay. it's a, I, I was watching you do this one. What happened? Here. I have this light here. I come into it with the dark. And while it's still wet, I come back into it with the light. And it will blend automatically. Is that light yeah. the same one that you used? Like the... Yeah. OK. And it kind of does this automatic, this, uh, automatic gradation as you go into it. All right, wow. So you Thank get you. a really That's smooth gradient. That's cool. Are those Copic markers? Uh, yeah, but I, they work with any marker. I tried to use Copics. I can't. I'm gonna, <laughs> that's actually, that's really great. Art Academy, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> David Finch is walking away with something. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys want to swap out? I'm going to have to fight one of you guys for this one. The sketch is sketch. It's like he's drawn Batman oh, sorry, before. <laughs> Right. So, I'm sitting here going, oh my god. I, this is, that's my pencil. My hand gets tired, so I have a lot of tape and stuff. Anyway, um, I use a drafting pencil. And then I just really, it, this is the way I do everything right now, because I'm making myself. Uh, if I'm just penciling, I do the same thing. I just really, really loosely sketch everything in right on the paper, because I'm too lazy to you know, pre-plan. And then. Uh, I use a kneaded eraser, I left it over there, but a kneaded eraser and I rub everything down so it's nice and light and then I, I just go in and I did it with this one with, uh, with a pen, I would just use a pencil and I just do, you can see some of it like here, uh, maybe you can, it's, it's a little blurry, but it's just a thin line just to get everything drawn in and then uh, if I'm penciling I use just my pencil and I just start blocking in all the shadows. With this one I used a, um, this is a Pentel. Uh, brush pen, you know, and I just just block in all my shadows really quickly. The light is coming from the upper left from here, and then I've got just like a little bit of a side light from the other side, which I really like when the color is light the other side, it kind of gives it some nice dimension. If I'm really brushed, I just do one light source, and that really saves me a lot of time. Uh, and then from there, what I'm going to do here is, is just my rendering. Um, and right, I'm using a I was using a proper brush and with proper tools, a quill. I just found I actually get a better result with, uh, with you know, just art pens, and um, I don't have a, an inkwell, so I can just sit on the couch and draw. Anyway, so this one here, it gets a nice thin to thick, or thick to thin, uh, and it doesn't. I've got a, a thinner marker that gets more detail. So from here, I, I put in my thicker line. With a pencil, uh, and actually, I'm going to show you. With a pencil to render, I always uh, sculpt up my line by kind of scribbling it in. I'm just going to switch your light source because you're a lefty. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. Better? So, yeah. okay. Because you can't get a um, you can't get a thin to thick line with a pencil without doing that. So that's how I always do that. But with a a, a pen, I can just add a little pressure. That took me a long time to get used to, actually. I've uh, penciled for so many years. I have a gentleman here with a question. Yes. Uh, yeah, like, how much control do you have over where they place the word balloons after your art? And, like, if you don't have control over that, do you ever try to steer them towards a specific space in the panel to use? Uh, I, I think really, unless you want to, you really ha don't have control over that. Um, that's, that's something the writer really controls. But as an artist, if you plan the panels, like, you, you see the dialogue in the script, and so if you leave room uh, for dialogue, then you can control it that way very well. And they're very, very generous about uh, trying to not cover the art with uh, with word balloons. It's been so rare that I've had something covered where it's been, you know, I've been sad about it. And even then, you know, I've, after you do this for a few years, you learn to let things go. You know, you really uh, you have to work in a team, and you can't always get everything. Sir. So I had a question was uh, Jamal when he was shading in. I noticed that when he was when he sketched it, he had essentially a line for the color. Mm -hmm. 
um, when he shaded it and he had to end up covering it up. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that kind of you kind of come back with like any white to kind of bring that back in detail, or if it just kind of just goes for like the darkness kind of effect. Uh, it depends on what I really want to go for. Uh, generally, I use like lines like that, like the collarbone, collarbone or the center of the chest as just guidelines when I'm sketching to make sure like my anatomy and everything is correct or where I want it to be. And then depending on where I'm going as I'm shading it, if I want to keep it in, I'll do it. If not, then it's no big deal for me. Similar question to when it comes to letters. How much freedom do you have as an artist in terms of how the page is laid out for panels? Do you often get dictated, oh, I want, is it the writer that dictates, oh, I want a nine grid, or oh, I want a four panel grid here? And do you have a preference between the amount of freedom you have versus how formal everything is? I want to say no when you're starting out. You really want to be as literal as possible because uh, being able to tell a story well is, in modern comics, I mean, the writing is, is, is high quality nowadays. It's not like it was in the 70s where, you know, every once in a while you got a great comic. But yeah, I, I would say as you go along, you can develop a rapport with the writer and you can play a little bit more with it if they're comfortable with it. But I would really recommend if they have a panel number, you stick to it and try and follow their, their guideline as much as you can. Um, your hatching, and this could go to all three artists, like for hatching, for the contours, uh, just different styles, I just kind of want to know what the reason for your style comes to hatching, cross hatching. Uh, well, okay, for me, I, I'm, uh, I'm an image artist, you know, that's like my roots, and I love all the the, you know, rendering and, and hatching being visually part of the, the picture and, and not just a transition from dark to light. It's actually, a, you know, kind of its own thing. I learned that just from copying from other artists, really. And it, it took ages. I really struggled with it for a long time because it's, it's sometimes not totally logical. But as far as like theory of it goes. <coughs> so if I've got a light source coming from up here, uh, I would have a shadow along this side. And then I would have a shadow here too because it's away from the light. And it, it, really, you should think of all your lighting like this as much as possible is, you know, where you have your light source, it's gonna be light and then away from it, it's gonna be dark. So it makes it actually, it's much easier to do lighting when you think about it in just simple shapes. Uh, Mike Mignola is my favorite for this because he just has such a genius for breaking down <coughs> things into really simple, blocky um, shapes. So, but rendering it, uh, the shape of my uh, tube is, is basically like this and it's follow it all the way through. So if I'm rendering, I want to make sure to follow that shape and not uh, deviate from it. Because if I cross like that instantly, it, it just breaks the and the other thing I don't want to do is I don't want to put a renderer here, or here a little bit, and then here. It can start to look very amateurish because it is a graduation from dark to light. So you want to think of, you know, if you've got if you've got a shape, you want you want to make sure to define that whole shape with rendering properly. I have a question. Yeah. Um, if you see Batman, is other um. I'm sorry, say if again? You, if you see Batman, is other problem problematic? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. If, if you see um, Batman, is other problematic? Is, is what problematic? Like, it's everywhere. Batman. Oh, the fact that there's Batman yeah. everywhere? Yeah. Um, I just think Batman is overexposed, I think, is the question. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, because there's a Batman out there for everyone, right? Yeah, like and I'm waiting type. for the next Batman video game. I'm waiting for the next movie. <laughs> How about you, America? Can you ever get enough Batman? No, no, it's cool. So <laughs> I'm happy to see him a lot. Absolutely. Batman <laughs> is so iconic, and you can 
have so many variations of whoever's writing or drawing or movies and video games and Batman Beyond and everything that there's so many iterations that it's hard to get tired of it. Hashtag job security. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I was wondering how many pages a day do you have to do to produce a monthly comic? How many? What's your page yeah. schedule to produce a monthly? One. You have to be able to do a page a day. Mm -hmm. uh, six pages a week. If it's 22 pages and you know, uh, I guess five. But uh, if you do five pages a week, and that is truly all you can do, a monthly comic is tough. I would really say I, what you want to be, you want to strive to be able to, your production should be the best that you can do in a day. Now, Jamal, you color yourself too, right? Yes. So what's your pacing? Uh, I'm pretty much the same. I kind of have to do a page a day just to keep on track. I've been lucky that my editors have planned things well enough that I start ahead of, like months, months, months ahead of time where I have the time where I can do a page a day and then take a little break of a couple days and then go into my colors, which honestly doesn't take that long for myself because it's my coloring is very simple since my drawing is very detailed. And then take a break from there and then go back to drawing a page a day. Mirka, how about you? Your schedule for a monthly book? Yeah, for a monthly book, uh, one page a day, yeah. One page a day from from the the layout to, to the inked. So, how many of you folks are hoping to break into comics that are here? Uh, Fletch, I don't think you can get out. <laughs> <laughs> Fletch is trying to break out. Um, <laughs> you guys producing sequentials too? Like, are you working on like pages? You have to a page a day yet? Uh, keep going. Oh, I, oh, I would say though. <laughs> When I broke in, I spent like a month on each page. I did three pages. It took me forever. And then when they asked how long it took, I said it took a day. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think maybe that's why they now expect a page a day? So it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, you really want to make your samples as good as you can possibly make them, you know, I, I think. So it's important to be able to do a page a day, but when you're learning, just take the time to make the art as good as you can possibly make it. And, Speed comes later. It's I would give yourself the time. You had a question, sir. Uh, thank you first for the panel. This is this is great. And just watching everyone, uh, you know, watching it build up. Uh, even with Jamal, because he's like kind of in the middle. It looked like going from sketch to almost like a three D print. <laughs> so that was great. But uh, do you find anything with with Batman being more difficult than other characters? Like, do you, is it just because of the character? Uh, yes and no. No, because Batman is so prolific that you know what he looks like. You know what your Batman is going to look like automatically. But also, because he's so prolific, everyone has their own idea and have a, has a very strong idea in the zeitgeist of what Batman is. So if yours looks a little off or is stylistically a little off, people might not gel with it. But really, you do you and that will bring your bring out your best work. Any other thoughts on that? Well, for me, the first time I did a Batman cover, I drew it three times. And then I finally, I was so nervous about it. It's something I wanted to do for so many years. And, you know, when you actually get the chance, this is your chance to put every, you know, 20 years of, of thinking about it into one picture. So it was very, very difficult. What was your first, which was the first Batman cover that you did? Uh, it was Batman 700. It was, it was a cover for, it was like a big special issue. So, I mean, it was a great way to be able to start, but yeah, I was so afraid of doing it. How about you, Mirka? Is Batman intimidating or difficult? Intimidating because, especially me, I, I don't draw him usually. Uh, for DC, I draw him uh, in a couple of pages. Uh, so, every time I have to to do also now I always feel I don't know how to do and uh, I try to do my best <laughs> but I don't know if, if it comes good young man did you have a question yeah. oh I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> all right Batman in the back in terms of like digital versus physical drawing is there like a general preference between you and other artists and what like what is there a preference that the pub publisher would want you to do 
Digital versus paper, go. I mean, I guess as the digital artist here, um, digital is just what I'm most comfortable with. I produce my best work that way, so that's what I'm gonna put forth. Um, generally, I think the consensus is digitally, if you draw digital, you will generally be uh, faster than if you draw traditional, but there's a certain look to traditional drawing that you just can't perfectly replicate with digital. And you, if you try to replicate it with digital, it, you will just go awry because it's a different medium. It's not supposed to do the same thing. So if you like that digital, if you like that traditional look, work traditionally. Do you do you? You put your best foot forward that way, and you will make your best art that way. If you like the digital look, do that. It's just two different styles, and obviously, if you work traditionally, you have pages that you can sell, which is Can't another be. thing on top of that. <laughs> How about you, Mirka? Digital or traditional? Well, uh, as Ima, I will, I often work in digital, and. Um, for many things, it's not easy as people think, as he told. But um, personally, I feel more relaxed when I do a page in digital because uh, in traditional, uh, I always fear to make some uh, mistake. <laughs> but that's because I think it's very personal. This thing is very personal. It depends about how you are used to do to work. There is not a, a, a uh, an answer, uh, a generic answer, what I see. Mm -hmm. How about you, David? I, I have to agree with, uh, with Jamal that um, I, I did both. I did digital for a year and I could not, I, I've been working for so long, I have a way of working and I, I just couldn't get that same look and it, I, I never was comfortable just letting digital be what it was, so I finally stopped. Um, I think yeah, for younger artists, it makes sense. You learn how to draw that way, and there's so many things that you can do. It's not a cheat, you know. You still have to be able to draw everything. It, it doesn't make you a better artist, but it certainly can make you more efficient. I just I can't make it work for me. And you don't have original art with digital, so. You had a question. Yeah. So um, I mean, this is kind of for everybody, but when it comes to posing, like, what kind of references would you recommend, or um, is there anything that you look? Like, I mean, like, there's light drawing and, um, is there, like, do you go to, like, any costume, like, themed ones? Because, like, there's the regular one, and then there's, like, costume that's really fun. Yeah. And do you prefer, like, the longer or the shorter gestures? Uh, <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. That's kind of a long question. <laughs> no, I didn't sign because there used to be a light drawing session in Toronto called, uh, Tunes on Tap. Yeah. Oh. I love that place so it much. This past year, I wanted to go, and someone told me it was closed. I was like, what do you mean? I know. So, these, normally when you're going to live drawing, it's nude posing with a naked model. Tunes on Tap had costumes, so they had people in cosplay as different things from superheroes to literally anything you can think of in costume posing and doing like awesome posing. And it was I can't so draw, much I fun. <laughs> it was so much fun and so much useful even to see, okay, this is this specific character. This is what Batman looks like and how the suit would look like in different poses, or this is how like cloth actually wraps around, and that was so much fun and so much useful, and I'm sad that it's not around anymore, and I really want to find another place like that. Can we put like a soundtrack too? Mm -hmm. yeah. The music was so good. The music was so good. Well, this poor girl, she never got to go. <laughs> Come on, man. I'm no, I, I did. Oh, I you got, did? I, I went a couple of times, it was really fun. That's why when I tried to go back this past year, they, I found out it was closed down. How about you, America? For references, do you like to see just figures, or do you like to see, you know, a cape or two? A cape. A cape or a costume. Or oh, and I, when I, if I have to draw a character, I prefer to to watch a lot of references uh, because, uh, as I told before, I'm sure I forget something if I don't see the reference. How about you, David? I. Um I'm such a huge fan of so many artists, and really all of them. I I love Joe Quesada. He did a, a Batman comic years and years ago that was inked by Kevin Nolan. Another one of my favorites. Uh, that's like a huge one for me. Um, Joe Mad. Look at a lot of his stuff. Uh, you know, 
Mike Vignola, I, I could go on and on, but really there are so many phenomenal artists and so many artists that are so incredibly dynamic and um, you can get, I, my opinion, I think you can get a, a lot uh, out of uh, figure drawing and life drawing and I think it's incredibly important. It's, it's a weakness of mine that I, I don't have much of a strength in that. But I do think for, for superhero comics it's really important to be able to draw really, you know, larger than life dynamic figures. Like when somebody actually, punch, like if you watch UFC, nobody's punching like, whoa, way out here and the, and the fist is here and the head's all flying back. You don't really see that. You get that from comics and I think it's important to learn from all the, the masters that have done it for so many years, and that's that's kind of my focus. It's what I like. All right, who wants to get some art? Yeah, <laughs> okay. All right, um, you guys can keep working if you're not finished. I don't under, David, I thought that drawing was done like 20 minutes ago, and it keeps getting, <laughs> it keeps getting more amazing. Well, thank you. It's blown but away. It is why I really like working, like an I mean, assembly, and it doesn't sound very nice, but I like getting the drawing in, then the shadow, and then the rendering, because I can stop at any point, and at least it's it's a finished drawing, just not quite as detailed. You know? <laughs> Anywho, I'll stop staring at that and give away some art. So um, we're going to do a couple of things. I'm going to pick three winners, one of each will get a sketch, and then everybody who did drawings along with our panelists, I want everybody that, that has art um, to come up at the end as well, okay? So we're going to do this, um, what I have coined Jim Lee style. Because uh, you guys didn't get tickets, right? Okay. Is there anybody whose birthday is today that can show me their driver's license? How about this week? This week, your birthday. Show me your license. <laughs> I think before we give out, it'd be nice to see the other. Oh wait, yeah, too, um, yeah, we're gonna. Oh, I didn't expect the lights. Okay, <laughs> can you kill him one more time? Oh, thank you. That's my husband. He's wonderful. <laughs> All right, Erica, you wanna show? Oh, I can just oh, take it up. Uh, okay, thank you. This is great. Thank you.